Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship uh, here on Facebook and YouTube. Um, I just pray that you do sing today. We're going to sing uh, Great Are You, Lord, right now.
Hey, good morning. Welcome to Mana Fellowship Church. Uh, my name is Brett. I'm one of the pastors here at Mana. Uh, we just want to say welcome. We're glad you're here. We're glad you could join us uh, to worship God this week, to sing songs and hear His Word preached. Uh, we hope that you were able to make it last week to our drive-in service. If you weren't, that's okay. Like We have all those resources online so you can go uh, watch that service as well. We have a ton of other stuff online, a daily devotional, uh, student messages, kids messages, things like that, um, all on our website um, and on our app. So you can check that out um, this week if you have, have time for that. Um, also, you'll see in the, in the description of this video that you're watching, there's some sermon discussion questions that go along with the sermon this morning. So we would love to encourage you and your family or some friends uh, to simply look at those questions and to have a conversation about the message that Pastor Rick's going to share uh, this morning to kind of help us not only hear this message on Sunday, but let, you know, be with us the whole week as we go about uh, the week with work or, or school or, or whatever that may be. So uh, we want those questions to kind of serve you and your family in this season. Um, also, the big announcement this morning, and, and I know we've gotten this question a lot, uh, we are rethinking some of our summer activities with everything happening in the world right now. Um, so what that'll look like is we won't have our traditional uh, youth summer camp or, or kids summer camp or things like that, but we're going to do things differently. We will still have summer activities and games and fun for students, uh, but that won't look like going to, to Sky Ranch uh, this summer. So I know Miss Amber's already got things uh, cooking for the, for the kids, and I've got some fun things planned for the students as well, but we'll talk about that to those individual groups over the next couple months. Uh, but we just want to let everyone know that this summer is going to look a little different, and we just ask for some patience uh, with that as we work that out together. Um, and then lastly, uh, it's greeting time. Like, Let's stand up and greet each other. Obviously, you're not here um, to do that. So we want to continually be doing things that will promote community amongst us. And so grab your phone again. Students, you're welcome. An excuse to pull out your phone. And I want you just to text someone that you haven't talked to in a while. Someone you, you might miss seeing on Sundays or just someone simply you haven't had a conversation with in a few weeks. And just tell them you miss them. Um, you could even right now as I'm talking, pull out your phone or your email and text them that uh, you miss being together and you hope that we can come back together soon. If you're on our Facebook or YouTube uh, video, live stream, uh, premiere, whatever we want to call it, you can even comment on there right now saying, hey, good morning, church. I miss you guys. And then as Pastor Rick is preaching, feel free to comment. Feel free to interact with one another because this is the, the way that it was meant to be. This is the way that sermons and discussions about spiritual things were meant to be. Uh, so I just encourage you to do that. And feel free to use your phones this morning. Uh, sorry, parents, again for that one. But to text one another and to just have conversations about these things. Um, so uh, before I pray, I just want to remind you one more time that there are giving options on our website, on our app. Um, lots of ways to give. You could come in here during the week, drop off a check if, if that's what the Lord leads you to do. Um, but I just want to pray as we give this week, as we serve this week, um, and as we engage with the sermon this week, that the Lord would guide us, he would lead us um, into all that he has for us. So let's pray uh, together. Yeah, Father, we just thank you that, that we could come together and worship you in spirit this morning. That we know that you are with us, each one of us, where we are this morning. Whether it's on our couch, at home, or at the dining room table, you are literally with us this morning, God. So we praise you for that. And as Pastor Rick opens your word this morning, as we look at the book of Ephesians, God, I, I pray that you would help us to see all the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. And that we would see them, and that we would enjoy them, and we would worship you for them, God. And we're just grateful this morning that we could sing songs together and praise you because you are good and you have saved us. And we're grateful and we're thankful for that. And we'll pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As 
eyes arise Strength of God Go before Lift me up As awake Eyes of God Look upon Be my sight Yeah As I wait, heart of God, satisfy and sustain. As I hear voice of God, lead me on, be my guide, be my guide. Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me. Christ be all around me, yeah. As I go, hand of God, my defense. As I rest, breath of God, fall upon, bring me peace, bring me peace above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around. be all around me, yeah. oh, 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 Christ be all around me, yeah, oh, 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 oh. Christ be all around me.
amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. Well, good morning. It is so good to see everybody this morning. I am so glad that you have tuned in to, to watch us this morning. If you're visiting with us this morning for the first time, we're, we're so glad that you chose to, to uh, watch us this morning. We know that you have a lot of choices out there, and we're just honored that uh, you chose to watch us. I, I, I got to just, if I can, brag on the Lord again. Um, as Paul said, if I boast, it, I'm boasting in the Lord, and uh, we know that all good things come from above, come from the Father of lights, and during these unprecedented times, God has blessed us exactly as we have prayed. God has blessed us spiritually with salvations. He's blessed us numerically, a number of people that uh, are following us, not just here, but in other uh, countries, and, and financially, our people uh, again, I, I just, every week I want to say thank you. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Uh, as a result of, of your giving, we've been able to give money to missionaries that are, are hurting and, and also, again, to, to local ministries here. And it, we may even be able to add some missionaries. We're talking to some missionaries right now and uh, add some missionaries 
and that is just fantastic during this time. Listen, we don't know how long this is going to last. Uh, we're going to get our word uh, from the governor. I know by the time you see this, you will have already heard that Kansas City uh, mayor has extended uh, the stay-at-home order, I believe, until May 15th. But uh, just bear in mind, we're in a different county, uh, and each county is a little bit different. And so we're going to wait to hear from our governor and wait to hear uh, from our county but rest assured, we're, we're still going to do things in a safe manner. Um, it, it's very important um, that we still adhere to uh, what people are telling us to do. And um, we still have some cases going on. We don't have anybody in our church that has it. Uh, but I will tell you that we do need to be aware of, we do have some situations in our church with marriages that are out of town and the relatives, grandparents uh, aren't able to attend. And that's, that's very hurtful. Uh, and even more hurtful, we have some people in our church that uh, have relatives that um, in God's timing could pass very soon. And it's all in God's timing. He's the one that holds the keys, but their relatives can't go see them right now. And uh, so let's lift them up in prayer. Uh, thank you. Last week, we had a great time last week at our drive-in service, and, and it was just a whole lot of fun, and it was good to see everybody. And, and always remember, uh, we are just a phone call away. I know we've been contacting a lot of you, but do not hesitate uh, to call us. Uh, with any need that you have, or honestly, if you just want to talk to somebody, if you're going stir crazy and you want to talk to somebody, uh, we are here and we're available. You can always uh, email me at rick at manakc.com. We're going to get into this week, we're going to go back uh, to studying the books of the Bible chapter by chapter, or verse by verse, and, and sometimes even a little bit this week, word by, by word, and, and we're going to be studying the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. And so if you want to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians, this is going to be a kind of a long introduction uh, today. We will get into some verses today, uh, but it's, it's also a long introduction. For me personally, I, I think that this is one of the greatest letters of the New Testament. Now I know I get excited about the Bible and I get excited about things of the Lord, so I know that it, I say that about a lot of books. I probably said the same thing when we were in Romans. Uh, but Ephesians contains both great doctrine and practical application for everyday living. And so I want to encourage everyone that's listening to read Ephesians through on your own as we're going through this several times while we're studying this book. And, and I believe if we will all do this, It'll change us because God's truth and doctrine has the power to change us. This book, this book of Ephesians, has everything the Christian needs to guide them in a consistent walk with Christ. Listen, just in the first chapter alone, look at this outline, the richness of this outline. We have God's purpose for the church in uh, verses, or chapter 1 and verse 3 and also verse 13. We have God's foreknowledge of his plan to redeem mankind from bondage in verses 1, 3 through 6. We have the, the question, what happens, or answers the question, what happens practically when we accept Jesus' redemptive sacrifice? That's verses 6 through 10 of chapter 1. Now, I, I'm just giving an outline of chapter 1 because we're going to be here uh, for the next uh, probably at least three weeks. Uh, and then we have the inheritance we receive as a result of the death of Jesus' death when we accept Christ. And that's 11 through 14. And then we have the resources that we have in Christ when we accept him, verses 15 through 23. And so you can, you can see just from the outline of the first chapters why we need to reflect on this book slowly and methodically so the truths of the doctrine can sink to our soul, helping us to live practically as a Christian. 
the first three chapters, there's only six, six uh, chapters, the first three chapters deals with God's truths or God's doctrine. And then the last three chapters deals with the practical application, how do we live out these truths? You know, in preparing for this message in, in, in Ephesians, I reflected back at, at some of the practical things that, that I've learned from this book, uh, really all the way from my teenage years when I accepted Christ up until now, and, and I hope together that we will learn the practical truths such as how the body of Christ and his church is to function. It was from this book that I learned as a pastor uh, when I surrendered to ministry 22 years ago, and I'm still learning to this day, how the ministry of the church belongs to the saints or the believers who are members of the church. How as a pastor, I'm both a member and a servant of the church called by God as a vocation to help people find their gifts in ministry, to prepare them to function in ministry, and most of all, to discover the abundant life or, or to ex discover the excitement of living as a Christian right where we are in, in the beauty and blessings and bombshells of life and in the chorus of good mixed with corruption and chaos and craziness of the world in which we live. It's from this letter that I learned as a young teenager, and, and teenagers, your ears can perk up a little bit right now, uh, because as a young teenager, it's from this book where I learned how to handle the sex drive which God gave me. And what it's given to all of us, and how to live properly and clean in our sex saturated society. It's also in this letter as a teenager that I learned the challenges of obeying my parents. In my case, uh, living with my mother and stepfather, I had to learn how to obey them even though they weren't Christians and didn't share the same values that I had. And I learned that when I obeyed them, I was actually obeying Christ. And I also learned that there was a promise uh, that came with that, that we would live long if we obey our parents. And, and teenagers, I'm going to camp out on that. When we get to that part, I'm going to camp out on that a little bit and give some personal illustrations along those lines. Once I learned those lessons... This book taught me about marriage and family life in a very practical way. This book also taught and teaches me how to handle the, the shifting winds in my head, of, head and heart of victories and defeat, of fear and anxiety, or I'm sorry, of, of fear and bravery, of anxiety and contentment, of depression and euphoria. And lastly, this book teaches me how to be both a good employee and a good employer or a boss. So listen, right now, if, if, if you feel a, a spiritual awakening in your life and, and God's prompted you that, you know, I want to get closer to the Lord and I want to draw closer to the Lord. And if you feel a need of change in your life and deepening your relationship with the Lord, I, I, I want to take the time and I want you to do it right now where you're at, uh, sitting on your couch or wherever you're at. I, I want you to pray right now that God will use this book to change us and change you specifically. And I've prayed, I've already prayed the same thing. Use this book to change us to conform to his image. This letter was written about A.D. 61 from Rome during Paul's first imprisonment there. It was written to the Christians in the Roman province of Asia. Now listen, these Christians were ordinary people just like you and me. They were tradesmen, they were craftsmen, a few doctors and lawyers and some politicians. They were the general run of the people. Many of them were slaves. And we'll spend some time on that when we get to that section. Now listen, there, there are some, I'll already warn you, there are some that come to this passage where it talks about slavery, and they say, there you have it. God and Jesus and Paul all approved of slavery. Nothing could be farther from the truth. That is why we like to study 
books of the Bible, chapter by chapter and line by line, because we can't just pull out certain verses to fit our narrative. In order to understand the Bible, we have to read it line by line, precept upon precept, and compare scripture of what we're reading with other scripture to get the full picture. This letter was brought from Rome by the hand of Tychius, to whom the apostle dictated the letter to. And it was circulated from church to church and read in each one where it finally ended up in Ephesus, and it was labeled the letter of Paul to the Ephesians and to the faithful in Jesus Christ. And so let's get into verses 1 and 2 right now. Read it with me if you have your Bible with you handy or if you're looking at it on your phone. Let's read this together. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and faithful in Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the shortest greeting of all of Paul's letters. But there's so much just in these first verses. Honestly, I could spend a whole message just in these first two verses. Just in these first two verses, we see Paul's qualifications. Paul is an apostle by the will of God. You may be saying, well, what makes an apostle? There was three qualifications to be an apostle. Number one, you had to see Jesus alive after his resurrection. Number two, you had to be chose by the Holy Spirit. And number three, you performed signs and wonders. So you can see from these credentials that we don't have apostles today because none of us have physically seen Jesus after his resurrection. Some may think, well, when did Paul see Jesus? Because he wasn't necessarily with Jesus on a daily basis like the 12. And uh, while he was not one of the original 12, he did meet all the, all the qualifications because, remember, he saw Jesus in a great light after his conversion in Acts chapter 9. We see here, not only in this greeting, but in other letters that Paul writes, Paul seems to always be amazed that he was called to be an apostle by the will of God. Now think about this. Prior to Paul's conversion, he was a, a bitter, intense persecutor of the church. He was a Jew who hated Gentiles, who would become converted. And once he became converted and started following Jesus, he would go on to love everybody, including the Gentiles. Paul could never get over that. I, I, I really resonate with Paul here. I, I've shared with uh, our congregation before, and if you're just listening in uh, for the first time, I'll share this with you. When I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, as, as a new believer, it was a game changer in my life. I knew that I was never going to look back, that I was going to follow Jesus for the rest of my life, except one time that I tried to walk away from Jesus, and I'll talk about that uh, a little later in this message. But I was so excited, and I went to my parents, and I said, I've accepted Christ. And, and they kind of looked at me, and they cocked their head and said, well, you'll get over it. Well, like Paul, I can't get over what Christ has done in my life. And Paul uh, couldn't get over this. Notice that he doesn't refer to his training as his credential at the feet of Gamayo. Uh, Gamayo was a, a lawyer during his time, and, and he spent a lot of time learning under him. And, and he doesn't refer to his Hebrew background or pedigree, nor the brilliance of his intellect, because he was a very intellectual man, nor anything else. He simply says, I am an apostle by the will of God. This is all that matters to him. Why Paul's academic qualifications may impress many, Paul is indicating that it pales in comparison to the calling of Jesus as his credential. Listen, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're watching this morning, you are called by Jesus Christ to be a missionary wherever your feet are planted. And the only qualifications 
that you need is the fact that Jesus called you, and as we're going to learn, because he's called you, he will empower you to do the job that you need to do for him. Then I want us to notice how he describes these Christians. He says, to the saints who are faithful in Jesus Christ. I think this word saint tends to scare us a little. We have a tendency to think of saints as, as being unreal or holier than thou and, and not like the rest of us. But I want you to understand that the term that Paul is using here and the saints of the New Testament are not that way. They're people just like you and me who believe in Jesus Christ. Saints are people who wrestle and struggle at times with relationships both inside and outside of the home. They struggle at times with making the right decisions, trouble expressing sometimes what they are really feeling. In other words, they're just normal people. But even though saints are normal people, we know in other scripture, from other scriptures that they are different. In fact, that's really the meaning of the word saint. In the Greek, it's a word derived from the word for holy. And holy means distinct, different, holy belonging to God, set apart, and therefore living differently. Paul addresses them as saints here because he, he, he is saying that they're saints because the characteristics are they are faithful, which means they can't quit. Paul is saying to the faithful saints, the characteristic is, is that they can't quit. That's what a Christian is, a, a person who can't quit being a Christian. Listen, a, a true Christian can't stop. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I invite you to try it. See if you can stop being a Christian. And if you can stop being a Christian, then you weren't one in the first place. I told you I've never looked back when I accepted Jesus Christ except one time in my life. And I, I don't have enough time to get into the, the story today, but uh, I, I felt like God was totally being unfair in a situation. Of course, he was being fair, but I'm just telling you the way I felt I felt like he was being totally unfair. I thought that he put something on me that was way too much to handle. I thought that he had forsaken me, which wasn't true at all. And I made a conscious decision that I was going to walk away from God. It lasted for about 30 minutes. And I, I, I remember as clear as I'm talking to you, speaking with the Lord and said, God, I'm done. I'm walking away. And within that 30-minute period, God melted my heart. I found myself on my knees, and I said, God, where am I going to go? Everywhere I go, you're going to be there. And God, you know I can't do this because I'm a believer in you, and you said that we can't lose our salvation, and, and you belong to me. And, and I remember telling God, which he already knew, God, you're mine, and I'm yours, and we're joined at the hip. i got to tell you, 27 years, you can fast forward 27 years later, we've never had that conversation. The, the point is, I couldn't walk away because I was a believer in Jesus Christ. And that's when he say, what he's saying to the faithful. It means you don't quit. Then Paul says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the two greatest inheritance for the Christian, once we accept Christ as our Savior, the two greatest inheritances that we get is grace and peace. I just want to camp out here a minute and explore those two things because they are great inheritance. And you know, I, I was thinking about, and preparing for this message, I was thinking about the inheritance of grace and peace. And I came up with an illustration that I know has some holes in it, but just bear with me a little bit. Imagine for a moment that you had a rich uncle who you never saw. 
but he saw you when you were born. He saw you, but you didn't see him because you were a newborn. And after the uncle saw you, he goes to a foreign country, and he lives there the rest of his life, and he's making a fortune in the mining industry. And while growing up, you didn't see your uncle. You, you only heard about him uh, from your parents. You knew he was a kind man and a, and a rich man, but that really didn't mean too much to you because you were kind of busy with your own life. Over the years, the uncle sends you cards of encouragement and money on special occasion, and he always asked how you were doing because he was generally interested in you as a person. But being so far away, you again, you really didn't pay attention to him. And throughout the years, not only did your parents tell you about him, but you read articles about your uncle's faith in Jesus and about how he helped people uh, through his business. And, and you heard about all these things, and the thought ran across your mind, well, I would like to aspire to be more like him. Then one day as you're growing up and you're maturing a little bit, you decide, you know what, I'm going to call my uncle and set up a meeting with him and find out more about him. And so you set up this meeting, you meet the uncle, you find out that his generosity is, is driven by his personal relationship with Jesus, and he tells you all about this one day that he realized that he was a sinner and he needed a Savior, so he asked Jesus to come in his heart and save him, and he's never looked back. It says it's the best decision of his life. You then come back to the States after you have this visit with your uncle, you come back to the States, and after you get back to the States, sometimes pa some, some time has passed, and you find out that your uncle has passed away. And you're sad, and you're thinking, wow, I, I didn't even have enough time with him. I wish I would have had more time with him. But upon reflection, and as you think about that, and you think about death, and you think about where would I spend eternity if I were to die, Upon that reflection, you, de you decide to accept Jesus, and you decide that you're going to adopt the ways of Jesus and adopt your uncle's lifestyle. Weeks pass, and you discover your uncle has included you in his will. And he wants you to carry on his business and his legacy, and he leaves you $10 million to do it. Now, some of you are imagining, don't get carried away. This is just an illustration. You're already thinking about how you could spend that $10 million. But this is just an illustration. But you just inherited $10 million, and you know that you don't deserve it because you barely know the guy. You just inherited $10 million and you get to carry on your uncle's business. Listen. This is just what Jesus did for us when we accepted him. He doesn't leave an inheritance of $10 million, but he gives us grace and peace to carry on his business until he returns. And I'm telling you, grace and peace is worth much more than $10 million or any amount of money. I'm telling you, even in this coronavirus environment that we're in, I'm seeing a difference in people. I'm seeing a difference between those who have grace and peace. They understand the threat of the virus, but because they know Jesus, they know that Jesus holds the future. And they put their faith and trust in Jesus more than they do the government. They trust Him for their health. They're not going to do things foolish, but they trust Him for their health. It's worth more than any amount of money when the world is running around with chickens with their heads cut off and, and fearing everything in the world to be able to have a peace and a contentment and show grace to people during this time. Grace is the most important concept in the Bible. Christian, it, it, it's the most important in Christianity. It's the most important concept in the world. It's expressed in the promises of God, and it's also expressed in the embodiment or the essence of Jesus. Grace is love that cares and stoops and rescues. 
Grace's unconditional love towards a person who doesn't deserve it. That's what the cross is all about, that Jesus loved us even while we were yet sinners. Grace shows up in the most difficult times. Grace shows up right in the middle of our sin, of our suffering, of our brokenness. Listen, we live in a very judgmental world. I just want to tell you this morning that judgment kills, but grace resurrects and makes alive. Grace is the opposite of karma. Karma is all about getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve and not getting what you do deserve. Because of our sin, we deserve death with no hope of resurrection our life hereafter. But because of God's grace of sacrificing His Son on the cross, we have this beautiful opportunity to accept God's grace and get out of the spiritual black hole that we're in. And then He says, grace and peace. If we have this grace and we, and, and we truly understand God's grace and how much grace God has shown us, then we have this wonderful peace. Peace is a sense of security and trust. Trust is not knowing the outcome and yet still being at peace, still being at rest. Now, I could camp out here and, and talk to parents. Um, I'll, I'll save that for, for chapter 6 when we talk to parents and the relationship between, between parents and children. But if you want to give your children something that's worth more than a million dollars, show grace and peace to them. And I promise you that'll translate into them having security. And when they have security, that will translate into them having confidence to do anything that they set their heart out to do. In verse 3, we have this tremendous summary of the teaching of this whole letter. It says this, read it with me, Blessed be the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I want you to get that this morning. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Paul states with clarity that God is behind all blessings. God is the starting point of all blessings. Our problem today is, sometimes as believers, we don't start our thinking with God. In fact, we tend to dwell on all the negative things instead of the blessings of God. And we don't start off our thinking with God. We tend to start it with ourselves and with our experiences, which is only a partial view of God's truth. It's like walking around with one patch over your, over your eye and, and never really having full vision. The only way to uh, view, or the only proper way to view truth is to see it in relationship to God's truth. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Throughout this letter, we find repeated phrase that everything occurs to the praise of God's glory in order that God should be praised, in order that his people are so in awe and so grateful for God's grace that their heart just pours out and it oozes praise and the glory and the blessings of God to other people. Last week we sang the classic hymn, How Great That Art. Uh, look that up. I, I, I don't have time to go into it, but it's kind of amazing how that song uh, came to be vogue here in the United States. But last week we sang the classic hymn, How Great That Art. Uh, how Great That Art. Listen, God wants us to proclaim how great thou art to the world because he's given us every spiritual blessing. Listen, maybe this morning you're watching this and you're down and, and uh, for a lot of different reasons, it, it really does come down to that old children's song, count your blessings, name them one by one. And I promise you, even right now, if you have a piece of paper beside you and you start writing down 
all the blessings that God has given you, I can almost promise you that they'll outweigh any negative things that has come your way this week. He wants us to look at our circumstances, no matter what they are, COVID-19, a death, financial loss, a divorce, a betrayal, and understand that we can get through them because he's given us every spiritual blessing. And the verse that follows, some of those blessings are listed. Listen to this, verse 4 through 6. Read it with me. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Now, let me just stop here before I comment on this verse and discuss what we discussed when we studied the book of Romans. Because we see it here again in Ephesians, the same thing that we saw in Romans. There's a great debate about these verses. It's been going on since the 17th century in the Netherlands when there was a theological dispute between John Calvin and Jacobus Arminus. The interesting thing about that is that they were good friends and they remain good friends even though they disagreed about these particular passages. Unfortunately, today we have brothers and sisters in Christ berating each other over this, something that Calvin and Arminius didn't even do. These two verses are text verses for Calvinists that we just read. Calvinists, when reading the words here that God foreknew and predestined, believe that God, by his sovereign grace, predestines people into salvation, meaning there is no choice to accept Jesus until he chooses you, and that Jesus died only for those predestined. So God chose me to be saved, but unfortunately, he didn't choose Pastor Bill to be saved. Pastor Bill is just in ministry because he loves people. <laughs> we know also Pastor Bill is saved too, but that is part of that thinking that Jesus died only for those predestined and that God regenerates the individual that he chooses. And once that person is chosen, then they are able and want to choose God. Armenians take a different tack on this. Armenians point out that God desires all people to have a relationship with him, not just some. In fact, Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness. But he's patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now listen, since greater theologians than me have researched Scripture and they've come to a conclusion, I also can study Scripture and come to a conclusion without denigrating my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so after careful study of the Scripture for the last 20 years... I want to declare to you that I'm a Calvinian, And let me explain that. Since Calvinists use to describe their position, they use an acronym, uh, acronym called TULIP to describe their position, I want to start there. The T in TULIP stands for total, total depravity. I agree with Calvinists on this point. We are completely sinful and completely affected by evil. Man's heart is evil. Man is a slave of sin. Man does not seek for God. He cannot understand spiritual things. He is at intimacy with God and by nature is a child of wrath. And you'll see the verses to back those up, those statements up on the screen right now. And then the U for TULIP stands for unconditional election. It means that God does not base his election on anything. He sees, or doesn't base it on anything that he sees in the individual. He chooses the elect according to the 
kind intention of his will without any consideration of merit within the individual. Also, as some are elected into salvation, some are not. Obviously, for me personally, I can't agree with that statement scripturally or logically. This thought of unconditional election leaves out free will of man that God created that Proverbs 16 talks about in John 7 and Revelation 3 and 1 Corinthians 10 and Deuteronomy 30 and John 1 and Genesis 2 and James 1, Galatians 5, Timothy 2, Romans 10, Psalms 37, Proverbs 16, Mark 8, 1 Timothy 2. Logically, and and that's scripture-wise why I can't agree with it, and you can look up all those verses, but logically, I can't agree with unconditional election because if unconditional election is true, then salvation is just an arbitrary lottery. If unconditional election is true, it seems, for, for me personally, it seems that God's creation is an act of cruelty. I'm going to create people in my image, and I'm going to choose you, to go to heaven, and I'm going to choose you to go to hell. If unconditional election is true, then really loving my neighbor is an unfair demand. If unconditional election is true, our natural response would be survivor's guilt. We would walk around constantly thinking, oh my goodness, why did God choose me, but he didn't choose my son, didn't choose my daughter. If unconditional election is true, can God really be trusted? So you have tulip, two, you total depravity, uh, and then you have unconditional election in the U, and then in the L of tulip, you have limited atonement. Again, this means that Jesus died only for the elect. Jesus only bore the sins of the elect. And again, I can't agree with this. The Bible teaches over and over and over that Jesus died for all mankind. The reason not all are saved is because they failed to repent, not because he didn't provide for their salvation. Isaiah 53 backs this up, 1 Timothy 4.10, 1 John 2.2, Hebrews 2.9, 1 Timothy 2.4, John 3.16, Romans 10.13. And then the eye and tulip is irresistible grace. It teaches that God's grace can't be resisted, but the Bible teaches that it can, and it is resisted. God was very gracious to Adam and Eve, but they resisted that grace and sin, and men and women have been resisting God's grace ever since that time, according to John chapter 6 and verse 37. And then the last P in tulip is uh, perseverance of the saint. It teaches that once saved, always saved. And I agree with this. John 10, 27 and 28 says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And my Father who gave them to me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Romans 8, 1 speaks to this. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Philippians 1, 6. So there you have it. After studying God's word, I agree with two points of Calvinist view and would differ on the other three. I agree that man is in total depravity and that we need a Savior. And I agree within that total depravity that we wouldn't even know that we're in total depravity because we're such sinners except God revealed it to us. And that's exactly why God says that he draws all men and women to himself. He is the one that's showing us that we need a Savior, and he's been doing it all the way since the beginning of time through foreshadowing and prophecies and also in the Ten Commandments. And I also agree that once you're saved, you're always saved. So... I differ on the other three, and I take the Arminian view, so that makes me a Calvinian. That's why I say I'm a Calvinian, so now I'll be hated by both sides. And, but while I'm being hated by both sides, 
I will always resist the urge to get in these endless debates, and I would rather and will focus instead on the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. So when a Calvinist points these verses out to me, and honestly, it's, it's usually what I would call the newbie Calvinist, like they just discovered something new that's been going on since the 17th century. I don't find this in mature believers that believe in Calvinism, but some of the newbie Calvinists, I mean, they're, that's all they think about, and they would rather argue and debate with you than walk across the street to tell their neighbor uh, about Christ or to help their neighbor, and they can't wait to show me these verses that we just read. And go, see, look, there it is. And I look at those verses with them and I just kind of say, yes, and your point is what? Because I read these verses and say, I think we agree on the same thing. God did know the the condition of mankind and he knew we would sin. So he did choose all mankind before the foundations of the world when he planned for Jesus to come to this earth to save mankind. And he did predestine us to become his sons and daughters through the adoption of his planning of Jesus' redemptive work on the cross. So Jesus planned that all would have the opportunity to be saved because of the cross, but also knew just as Adam and Eve had free will and free choice to sin or not, there would be some who would reject his plan and they would choose hell over heaven. I think sometimes we want to debate so much that we miss the larger point. And to me, the larger point of these beautiful verses is that you and I were important enough to God before the beginning of time He had us in mind. Before the foundations of the universe, He had us in mind. Before the foundations of the universe, He looked down and and could foresee the future, and it broke His heart that men and women would sin. And He said, you know what? I can't look upon sin, but I still want to have a relationship with my creation. And so I have a plan and I'm predestining it right now. I'm planning it out right now. And there's going to be a certain time in history where I'm going to send my son to die on the cross. And he's going to come down from heaven and live on this earth 33 years and go to the cross and be resurrected the third day. God saw us in that planning And he wants us to be members of the family of God. In fact, he wants it so bad, he did everything for us. And all we have to do is accept him. Because in verses 7 and 8, read it with me now, it says this, In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the great riches of his grace, which was made to abound towards all of us in wisdom and in prudence. Think about that. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, all your guilt is removed. It's literally gone. This is a great verse. We are called saints because we believe in Christ and we can never lose that salvation. And God has given us redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sin. And because of that, or as a result of that, God has shown us this grace when we deserved hell. He sent His Son to die on the cross for us and instead offers us heaven, offers us a relationship with Him. And while we are living on this earth and we accept Him, He says He has given us all spiritual blessings. What a wonderful thing it is to be a Christian. We're just getting started with the book of Ephesians And I just want to say this, maybe you're watching today and you would say, Pastor Rick, I heard you talk about that grace. I heard you talk about peace. And I have to admit, I don't have that peace in my heart. I don't have the peace that the Bible talks about, this peace that passeth all understanding, that in the midst of the craziest times in the world or the craziest challenge in our life, we can still have peace. 
We can even say, I don't like it. I don't like the challenge I'm going through, but I have peace. I still sleep very well at night. Maybe spiritually, your soul is restless because you don't have that peace. You've never invited Jesus into your heart and you've never thought about that even before we were created, that God had you in mind when he sent his son to die on the cross. Listen, if you were the last person on the face of the earth, I want to tell you that God loves you so much that he would have died for you alone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, that's a promise from God, will not perish but have everlasting life. Would you like to accept Jesus today? You can. You don't need a pastor. You don't need a priest. You only need Jesus. If you want to do that right now, wherever you're at, wherever you're watching, all you have to do is, number one, be sincere about it and understand that you are a sinner. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Number two, believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and that he loves you. And number three, ask him to come into your heart. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Would you do it today? Would you just pray this prayer after me in your heart and mean it in your heart? Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I thank you for loving me and I thank you for dying on the cross for me. Lord, I ask that you would come into my heart right now. I need you, Lord. And I ask that you would come into my heart. And I ask that you would save me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, we would love to hear from you. Um, just write me at uh, Rick. It's very easy. Rick at manna, like manna from heaven. M-A-N-N-A. -N -N Rick at manna, K-C. Dot com, and I'd love to hear from you and tell me that you accepted Christ and, and I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about that. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great Sunday and uh, be sure to catch all the videos that we're putting out during the week. Be sure to catch our youth pastor's uh, lessons to the youth and his daily devotion uh, that's on our website. Be sure to catch uh, our Thursday uh, interviews with missionaries and, and other testimonies. They're, they're great interviews that will be inspiring and, and challenging. God bless you. We'll see you next week.